More than two thirds of the country is under grass pasture grazing, mostly under the stewardship of 120,000 small family farms. But agriculture is the single largest contributor to Ireland's greenhouse gases, accounting for one third of overall emissions. In UCD's School of Agriculture, Dr. Helen Sheridan is working on a novel approach to reducing the need for chemical fertilizers by growing a special mix of smart grass. So I, I recognize the rye grass. I recognize the grass with the clover. Yes. This I do not recognize. What's in this third field? This is our multi-species grassland type. So we've got the grasses, legumes, and forage herbs within this. So what you're seeing a lot of there now is chicory and ribworth plantain. But we also have red and white clover, and we've got timothy as well as the perennial rye grass. And the cows and the sheep can live on this. Absolutely. This they looks like it. my salad for dinner. <laughs> Our big salad bowls, they, they, they seem to really enjoy it and they're growing very well on it and um, they seem to respond very well in terms of worm burdens, etc. So, yeah, it's, it's great for them. Helen's study found that it was possible to grow more feed on only a small amount of fertiliser with only a fraction of the emissions. This type of smart grass could reduce the costs to farmers and could dramatically reduce the emissions from livestock farming. It seems almost so simple. You're using things that already exist, but just in a far more intelligent manner. Well, I guess it's not, it's not new. People did this in the past. Um, they knew how to use plants to address the issues of the challenges that they had. And I guess that's what we're doing. We're borrowing information from them and then, uh, you know, adapting it with new technologies. These smart grass trials show tremendous potential to be a low tech solution to the major problem of chemical fertilizer pollution. But could these kinds of efficiencies go mainstream on a working farm? Farming is the lifeblood of rural Ireland, but intensive beef and dairy farming is having a devastating effect on our environment. What if there was another way to farm in harmony with nature, but without affecting farming incomes? Regenerative agriculture is a name given to a rising trend that prioritises naturally restoring soil, which eliminates the need for chemical fertilisers. Can regenerative farming, which focuses on soil health, offer a solution to farmers to continue to farm beef and dairy, but in a sustainable way? I was an intensive dairy farmer. I changed in 2015 and that largely because I suppose I felt the resilience of, my, of the type of system I was involved in was, was really decreasing and I was very vulnerable to kind of climate change and, and oil price spikes and all of these externalities I suppose that um, could affect my income. I was heavily dependent on, on NPK fertilizers, spending between 30 and 40,000 a year uh, on, on these inputs and again, you know, another maybe 20,000 on feed inputs as well. It, to me, wasn't a sustainable system and wasn't resilient for a changing world. Much like Helen Sheridan's smart grass, John's grass swords are made up of herbs, legumes, clover and other mixed grasses to draw minerals from the ground that would otherwise need to come from chemical fertilizers. Additionally, mob grazing is critical to regenerative farming. This is where the cows spend a short amount of time feeding on a small piece of grassland. In essence, it mimics nature, where wild animals would arrive in large herds, eat quickly and then move on. This gives the soil and the grass plenty of time to regenerate. So mob grazing or holistic grazing, I suppose a big component of it is all this diversity you see. And it's also actually these much more mature swards. And so you can see these plants going to flower and plants going to seed. And all of these actually, when a plant goes to seed, a lot of actually minerals are produced in that period of time. So a lot of the trace minerals that actually would never be released from the soil if we just keep it in a vegetative stage all the time. And so actually that's how minerals get properly cycled. 
and so now you're actually used, utilizing all these different plants and allowing them to you know to flower and to seed and actually that's bringing about you know it's building up it's building up again the, the mineral status which again has an impact on these animals and the health of these animals there's actually a place in productive farming there's a place for all of the, all of the, the full spectrum of nature we don't have to separate nature from the, from productive agriculture both can actually work in harmony why not have plants providing minerals for us rather than a factory in Germany? But I suppose straight away, you can, the amount of diversity I can see on the farm, when you start letting plants flower and go to seed, straight away you're providing food. You know, there's a lot more birds, a lot more insects. The same, you dig a hole in the ground now and you're just, there's vastly more worms. You can see the soil structure changing. So there's a, a little worm. So all these guys are, are the unseen workforce and yet in healthy soils. You, you know, on this farm there'll be, there could be twice or three times the amount of weight of earthworms as there is actually in cow cows on this farm. Well, soil is fundamental to farming. It's fundamental to all life. You know, we're, we're made of t soil technically. You know, we're, we're like, this is where all our food comes from. Friable soil, like that's indicating that things are working right, that things are happening what it should be. John no longer uses any chemical fertilizers. He's also converted 20 acres of grass to oats, allowing him to cut out all his imported feeds, further reducing costs and carbon emissions. The savings on reduced inputs means John doesn't need as many animals to maintain his bottom line. Forestry planted on his land further offsets some of the remaining emissions from the farm which are now a small fraction of what they once were. When I engaged in this path, I, I traded some cow numbers for, for more resilience in my farm. It, it didn't really have a big impact on profitability because I suppose I'm now getting a premium for my milk and a massive benefit in lifestyle as well, so the system is much easier to, to run. We're, we're not just limiting, I suppose, our, our, what we produce or our output just to, just to milk and looking at milk solids per hectare or beef, live weight gain, or, you know, we're, we're looking at the full picture. And I suppose as farmers, I think we need to do that. We, we have been just so focused on beef and milk, and it's now costing farmers. You know, it, that has suited maybe the commodity-driven systems. It has suited processors who want to sell a lot of cheap produce at profit to them, but not a profit to farmers. Um, and I suppose farmers, it's time for us to wake up. We listen too, too long. I suppose we listen to other people telling us what to do. We listen to those selling us input. We listen to those who had a, had a you know, who were benefiting from having huge amounts of cheap commodity. And it's now time to start looking at the bigger picture and taking a more holistic, a holistic view and looking at all the different potential outputs we can have from this farm. Regenerative farming practices like this provide many societal and environmental benefits, like reduced impacts to water, increased biodiversity habitat, improved soil health, and much lower greenhouse gases. Imagine if more farmers were encouraged to do this across the country and the impact it would have on Ireland's emissions. Currently, however, our policy is still leading us in the opposite direction. Without a shift in incentives, it'll be very difficult to convince conventional farmers to change their habits and follow John's approach. But is that about to change? Philip O'Brien is the EPA's Chief Scientific Officer in the area of where land use and agriculture impacts climate change. We are pushing the limits in some aspects of our farming. Uh, I think the dairy side, as it expands, and it expanded quite rapidly in the last few years, I think in areas of the country we see that it isn't just climate which is an issue here, it is uh, air quality and also water quality. And these are the issues which put the constraints on intensification. So, I mean, is the bottom line that we need to produce less beef and dairy? There's a maximum number of animals on the, and that, the, that the country can sustain without detrimental impacts throughout the entire um, environmental regime. And I think we will see where we have to stabilise 
the herd. It is a tension between the economic and the environmental, but you have to create a balance in the incentives and so on to give the farmers and the landowners the appropriate choices to push them in the right direction. And I think that's what the market is going to look for as we go forward. Uh, they're going to look for more and more demonstrable proof that what they're buying is not harming the environment because it's all about saying it but you also have to prove it. I think that's so interesting that you're saying because it's people power that you're mm. talking about and I'm wondering then how do I go into a supermarket and see that what I'm buying is produced sustainably. I mean, we know it's produced from Ireland because it says mm. it's Irish. There's no logo that says it's sustainable. There's no grading system. How do I know? Yes, um, I think that's where where initiatives such as Board B and so on, and actually the smart farming, which is working at a different level uh, at the farm scale, these could probably look to better labelling, but also people need to be educated to these as well, to what, what the labels actually mean and so on. Um, so I think there is work to be done there. Um, and people do have to actually step with money as well. They may have to pay that premium price for the product because it is delivering on not just the food aspect, but delivering on the environmental integrity that we want. And do you think that that's just something we need to assume the government will...? There's no assumptions. This is something we will have to ask governments through to our dem democratic processes. We have to ask the, insist on the governments to deliver those things for us. There are other moneyed interests who might be pushing in the other direction, so you know, the dem democracy has to win out here, and what the people want has to win out. Grassland production is recognised by the IPCC as the best way to produce meat and dairy. But Ireland's grasslands have a limit on the number of animals that they can support sustainably. Emissions can be minimised through innovative farming practices like regenerative farming and agroforestry, which can drastically reduce the negative impacts on the environment. Currently, Europe's common agricultural policy is under review and negotiation. If this policy is to become a solution to climate change, instead of continuing to be an obstacle, then it will take citizens to get informed and demand policies that prioritise environmental protection as well as the future of Irish agriculture. <laughs>